Welcome to APCUG's Wednesday Workshops, where we get together in the middle of the week, in the middle of the day for some of us. And actually today we're in the middle of March already. Time just keeps going so amazing. The third Thursday or third Wednesday of the month is traditionally a Linux day. So we are here to do Linux. Today is going to be a round table where we are going to be discussing the um, different software that we use trying to find out what's popular, what's new, and what's maybe unique and different that we want to try. The way we'll do this is that we will start with the Linux team, which includes Orv Beach. And I have to say, Orv, we're glad you're here because we need you. Get that? Yes. We need yes. you. Need you. <laughs> yeah. For those of you here last month, you knew that Orv decided to give up Linux and have a knee replacement. And we've heard that things are going well. Along with that's Cal Elsnott from Cajun Clickers down Louisiana, Dave Melton from out west in California, and uh, myself for today. And we're always interested in other members to be part of our Linux team. Bill James is our co-host. Glad to have him by my side, because right now he's by my side. And Judy Tallur here for taking care of all the uh, chat box, the questions, which shouldn't be too many. And uh, we'll be calling on you when it's your turn to do. So I am going to first set that up. Uh, so we'll go through the team first, to talk about the software, and then uh, when you want to share uh, information about the top software you use for that particular task, just raise your hand and then we'll call on you. And if you have your sheet, you can be taking notes like I'm going to be taking notes. So we're going to start out first with uh, browsers, uh, probably one of the most used task in the internet or on the computer. And so we're going to talk about what we uh, use. So I'm going to just go as I did order, uh, Orv, Cal, and Dave, and then I'll come up with the end and then we'll open it up for everybody else. So Orv, how about you want to start with what you use for browsing? Sure. Um, over the years, many years, I've been using Linux. I've moved around, but um, Longtime Google Chrome user, but in the last couple of years, I've moved back towards Firefox because I'm a little concerned about the deep integration with Google Chrome and the Google Metaverse. And I'm pretty happy with Firefox. Um, the 1Password integrates with it pretty nicely now, too. Cal. Yes, yeah, so I've always, I use Firefox. I've always used Firefox. I think it's a good compromise. It's fairly good with privacy. Uh, I don't like Google. Um, I use it with DuckDuckGo. And, and so uh, it comes with all Linux distributions. I've never had a problem with it, it installing. Uh, so that's, that's what I've stuck with. How about Dave? Um, yeah, so I've, I've come and gone numerous times with Firefox, and I'm still using Windows mostly, so um, I use Edge, but my, my daily browser is, is Brave. I've tried Chromium. Um, I like it fine, but um, I've, I've had real good luck with Brave, and I know, as I shared with the team earlier, I know it does pretty good blocking as far as uh, unwanted sites. So I'm pretty pleased with it. Good. Um, I'm also a Brave user, uh, plus Firefox. Um, I'm liking the security with, with Brave, but I have on my computers probably about four or five different browsers to try out because people ask questions. So I also have on my computer Vivaldi and Chromium and Firefox and Brave, so that's four. Uh, but I like it for that. I do want to mention that uh, Dave may not always uh, share something because he doesn't use everything that's on this list, and that's fine. So you don't have to share everything on the list. You can share with us what you do use and maybe 
skip what you don't use and may, maybe find out I ought to give something a try. So uh, that's it for the team. We'll open it up for uh, everybody else to share. What are you using? Uh, let's find out what's out there. Looks like Tim has his hand raised. Yeah, Judy didn't unmute to say. Yeah. <laughs> so now she's gonna call on Tim. <laughs> yeah, you're on Tim. Okay, thank you. Oh, okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you. And I use quite a few different uh, uh, browsers. I have used Edge on Linux uh, along with uh, Chrome, but uh, I've uh, gotten away from them quite a bit. I do use Chromium and Firefox the most, but I have tried others. But I've got a gotcha. Uh, I've got one system here, a Linux, that I installed ungoogle chrome it's got some real gotchas to it and uh, uh, one of them is if you are a person who uses extensions you cannot get them like you normally would on chrome or chromium and the chromium based uh, various browsers what you have to do is have a, a, a an extra feature i found a video and uh, bottom line is it will uh, uh, allow you to download a CRX file for each individual extension you want to include. Then you just run them. They install normally. They work normally, uh, just as you would expect. But when you go to the uh, Chrome Web Store for uh, extensions, uh, you see them. You can search all you want, but it will not give you the opportunity to uh, uh, download them directly. So I, I thought I'd put that up because uh, uh, some people are looking at the ungoogled uh, Chromium uh, browser uh, because it detaches from the Google for uh, greater privacy. And on all my uh, browsers, I switched uh, a year or two ago to duck, duck, go. That's it. That's good. Thanks, Chip. Because that really makes sense that if, if you're going to de-Google and most of those extensions are designed for Chrome, yeah, you might have a problem there. Kurt, your turn. Yeah, we're li listening to people that use different browsers. The question becomes, what, what do you use those browsers for? And I'll use myself as an example. If I'm doing general browsing, I usually use Chrome. If I am working on a website or something like that, I use Firefox. I'll also use Firefox for some, some general uh, general browsing. But in particular, I've gotten used to some tools that are in that are in Firefox to examine websites. And every once in a while, if I just don't care, I'll I'll go fire up Edge. <laughs> Thanks. <clears throat> And on to Steve Parker. Yeah, I've been using uh, Firefox for quite a while. And there's a, a profile folder that has all your settings and all your configurations and tabs and bookmarks and everything in it. Um, is it possible to take that folder from a Windows 10 and put it into Linux and get it to work? Don't everybody answer at once. I think that's something that Google might know something about. I've never tried it. Well, you can move your bookmarks through an HTML page. I don't know about your whole profile, but I move my bookmarks quite a bit. Well, th does Linux use a different profile structure or setup than it does in, in Windows? I don't know. I uh, personally, I don't think uh, uh, it does uh, uh, have a difference because the browsers are made by someone other than the OS uh, uh, creators. And so the end result is I think uh, they are exportable. Uh, 
I, I haven't done one in, I have no idea how long, but I remember there used to at least be a feature for exporting the bookmarks so you could uh, uh, incorporate them back in on an import, say on a new machine you just bought. Yes, I do that all the time uh, for bookmarks. Um, the Mozilla, and can, and oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Um, did a little Googling and there's an article on mozillazine.org um, moving from Windows to Linux and has about a three or four step procedure for moving your uh, profiles from uh, Windows to Linux. So yeah. Okay. And it's not just a straight copy, this folder to that machine. Um, yeah, copy the contents, blah, blah, blah. Um, yeah. Okay, good. Because I found that much easier to handle than having to transfer settings for bookmarks and tabs and extensions and all that sort of stuff. You might just as well reinstall Windows from scratch as do that. Yeah, I put the link in the chat. And it will come to you in the follow-up email. Thank you. David Lewis, you have your hand raised. Thank you. Thank you. I've only restarted using Linux very recently. And when I was looking at trying to sync uh, with my uh, Windows devices in Google, I found that uh, Chromium for some form of privacy reasons, I had some flaws in it. Uh, the synchronization is no longer technically available. But that if you Google, you can find a way of uh, importing your your bookmarks, etc. So a, a recent or comparatively recent change has reduced the ability to synchronize that uh, used to be there. That's all. Thank you. Any other comments about this? I have in the chat box, uh, George Bowden from Victoria Group uses Chrome and Firefox. Howard Lee. There I am. Um, uh, for browsers, I'm kind of gravitating towards Brave. Unfortunately, my main Linux box is a Raspberry Pi. And uh, Brave does not run under Raspbian or the Raspberry Pi OS yet. Uh, mm -hmm. It does appear that I can run Ubuntu on the Raspberry Pi, but I haven't tried that yet. Thank you. Kevin, your turn. I thought it might be mildly interesting to say what I don't use. Um, although I don't, I'm not a regular user of Linux, uh, but I sure want to learn more. That's why I'm here today. Um, I don't use Opera almost ever anymore because it just seems too, too much of its own advertising thing. And it wants to stay hanging around all the time when I do turn it on. And I just haven't been pleased with that. I do uh, consciously use Firefox a lot. I have, I use Chrome if Firefox is not around. I, I use a lot of people, I go to a lot of people's homes and use their computers. So I use whatever is there. I tend to go with Firefox, uh, use Chrome a lot and um, use Edge almost if I have to. And um, let's see. And I, I think that's about it for that one. Thank you. How about Vivaldi instead of Opera? I, I, I wrote down Vivaldi when, um, uh, when John said it because I had never heard of that. I, I use Linux as a tool to allow me to do things I can't do. If, so, if there's a computer with a hard drive that Windows isn't working well, I will boot up with a memory stick into Linux and then Linux will allow me to copy that data from their hard drive to an external device. And so I'm still... <laughs> Even, even though I was at a, uh, let me see, um, uh, even though my first taste of Unix was Linux, was U my first taste of Linux was with Unix back 40 years ago, uh, or actually 45 or 50 years ago, um, I still uh, don't use it as much as I would like. So I, I have no clue about Vivaldi, so. 
Well, I'll just I'll just mention since you asked that, uh, Vivaldi is the creation or the new creation by the person that started opera, who gave it up years ago because he just needed to move on, and he was not happy with what opera was going doing and what direction they were heading. So he just took and as I've mentioned many times in in workshops about the recipe. So he got his recipe out and then he improved on it. So it's a much better uh, browser. Uh, I haven't used it enough to become really good with it, but I, it's, it's very good. So if you don't like opera, uh, you might give Vivaldi a try and see what you think on that. Thank you. That was why I asked the question, John. Over to George. For people who want portability on bookmarks, you can write a little CRUD uh, app and put it in your hosting site. I have a one page CRUD thing, which I've used for a number of years. Each row is a different topic. And I have a very short link to uh, the different web pages. I'm always on so many different machines with the club and things like that. I need to get the things without having to log in with my, with my ID on, in Chrome. And so uh, that works really well. And I was kind of surprised that it works so well after so many years. Anybody else have anything to say about the browser topic? I, I'll, I'll finish up by saying oh, that Bill we, did, uh, we uh, didn't, yeah. Bill has okay. his hand raised. We'll let Bill hand, go ahead, Bill, unmute. Unmute, please. My big question is that everybody's interested in having uh, their bookmarks all in one place. It's why not use Edge because it's available for Windows, uh, Linux, and any other operating system, and you can just use it cross-platform. You don't have to bother about uh, moving bookmarks and doing all that nonsense. Or I would say use a bookmark manager. Thanks, Bill. And Steve, you're on. Does the Avast secure browser run in Linux? Has anybody tried that? I haven't tried it. Uh, I am aware of it. It's based on Chromium, so odds are yes. Does anybody use the Avast Secure Browser? On Windows systems, I do use it uh, occasionally uh, uh, when I uh, want to avoid uh, Google. <laughs> yeah, I use it whenever Firefox doesn't work on a page. <laughs> I will ask Bob G. Well, I know he uses it. <laughs> yeah. No, no, I'll just, he doesn't use Linux, but he will let me know if it works with Linux. Okay, to finish up, uh, I will mention that uh, for the Linux users who are going beyond and want something uh, just text-based, there are a few command line browsers. And so you get all the information and none of the ads, but that would be for uh, another, another time on that. All right, let's uh, move and talk a little bit about file managers. That's a very uh, popular or a very important part because we have to do things with our files. So um, start back over with uh, Orv. How about a file manager? Well, since I'm a KDE Plasma user, I use their provided uh, file manager. I don't know why it's called Dolphin, but that's the name of it. Very, very versatile. Um, Split screen, drag and drop, uh, lots of plugins, um, lots of features. Um, uh, it's um, joined at the hip with their uh, file viewer, uh, image viewer, which is called. Hang on. <laughs> Let me. I use it so often, I don't even think about it. I'm sure it's something that starts with a K. It's Gwen View. <laughs> and it doesn't. <laughs> it doesn't. <laughs> uh, yeah, but uh, Gwen View will rotate, crop, mirror, 
uh, and, and do a few other things, let you look at the meta metadata, the EXIF metadata. So anyway, Dolphin uh, has my thumbs up uh, for uh, Linux, for a file browser. I, I don't use anything else. Cal? I normally uh, am in Linux Mint, and they have uh, their Nemo, which is a derivative of GNOME files, or used to be called Nautilus. It's got split screen. It's pretty simple. Uh, it does everything I want. Uh, it's part of the system. If I go to another Debian system, non-KDE, uh, GNOME files is there, pretty familiar. So I'm, I'll stick with the default. Dave? Okay. I'm going to follow suit here. Um, since I use KDE mostly, I'm using Dolphin like Orv. And I've been sticking with the provided file manager that comes with that distribution. Um, I, I like Dolphin quite a bit. It's, it, I mean, Orv covered a lot of it. The split screen is, I find, very handy. Um, that's something I keep wishing Windows would do, and I'm hearing that they're going to do that. Uh, but uh, I haven't had any issues with it. It's it just does the job. So that's that's all I have. Um, I will mention for people who are are listening and wondering that the split screen is different than dual panes because you can open up a second. Uh, file manager in Windows and have two of them going you know, side by side. But with a lot of the Linux file managers, there is an option for a split screen. So you have two of them on your same screen. The advantage to that is that uh, I use the file manager that comes with uh, Mate, which is Kaja, uh, which is another branch off of the original uh, Ubuntu GNOME Nautilus, um, and and if anybody didn't catch it, that the the one that Cal uses with Cinnamon is named Nemo, which came from the original Nautilus. So if you're any of you are uh, twenty thousand leagues under the sea people, uh, but anyway, uh, we have when you have a split screen, most of the time you have an option that when you want to move a file, that you just click the file you want. And when you right click, it says copy or move to the other pane. And it is so easy to be moving files around that way. Um, so uh, if I didn't do the Kaja, I probably would be downloading and using the uh, Dolphin because I think it has a lot of good features. I think Kaja and uh, Nautilus have improved theirs to give you just about everything that you'd want to. Uh, I also have on my computer, as just a trial, one that's a lightweight file manager called PC uh, Man FM, FM mm -hmm. for file manager. And that's the one that usually comes with uh, a lighter weight distro, I mean, a desktop environment. So it's pretty much what you'll find out is that each desktop environment has their own set of tools that are kind of equal to, and each de each development team tries to make their version a little bit better. The other thing I'll mention about Mint, since we have a number of Mint people, is that Mint is going to the process of developing tools that are for Mint, not for Cinnamon Mint, Mate Mint, XFC Mint. So a lot of the things you'll hear people talk about will be X things, just like K things for uh, Orbs KDE. Mint now is producing a lot of X files and there'll be for all three. So they'll be the same. So it won't matter whether I'm running Cinnamon or Mint or XFC, those tools will be identical in, in, as the development goes along. Good, good to know. Yeah. Can, can I add on to the Dolphin um, browser or manager? Is what the one of the ways I use that is I copy things, for instance, from my network drive over to my local drive, and that split screen is really nice for that because I can look at both sets of files at the same time. 
and and I I've, I've done that quite a bit. Good. Okay. How about others? Anybody have any other file managers that uh, that you like, or do you use the ones that come with it, or do you get some extra ones? Andy does. Hi. Um, I split my time mainly on Windows, but getting more and more into the Linux side of things. Uh, a lot of older hardware, so I'm running XFCE normally on Linux Mint, but I dabble with a whole bunch of things. One of the things that's made it easier for me to go from Windows to Linux is to look for the similarities or try to make them as similar as possible. So on the Windows side, I use uh, a file manager called Free Commander. And on the Linux side, they used to have Tux Commander, but that's been deprecated. I use Double Commander. It's got the split screen, multiple tabs on each side of the screen. Um, my typing sucks, that's a technical term. So I like having one finger, like F5 to copy or F6 to move. I don't have to type. Um, pretty decent viewer. It's um, it's worth checking out. That's about it. And like I said, on the on the Windows side, it's very similar to Free Commander, which is a portable app. Uh, I don't remember who was up first time earlier. Uh, they were talking about helping people out with uh, dead or dying machines with a flash drive. Free Commander is one of the portable apps that's on my flash drive because copying, uh, you know, like John was saying, from one side to the other, from a, a local hard drive to an external hard drive or local drive to a network drive, the split screen is, uh, is very valuable. It's, it doesn't leave a lot of question marks as to whether or not you did what you thought you were doing. That's it. Thank you. Anybody else have comments on their favorite file manager? Going, going, oh, Kevin. Good. I, I just need to ask, it, because I'm primarily a Windows user, do you want to know what I use as a Windows user or should we just only limit it to Linux stuff? Linux stuff. Okay, then I will shut up. No, that's okay. Go ahead and tell us now that you brought it up. Well, I just, you know, I being a mainly Windows guy, I use mainly Windows stuff. So I use File Manager or fi File Explorer. And um, <clears throat> I have done what John said earlier with often bringing up two copies, one on the left side of the page, one on the right side. I know I don't need it, but sometimes it's just easier to drag and drop stuff from the left side to the right side. That's my the way I do it. Um, I often use, I started using their search more and more often um, because I've, I've got an old, old, old degree in computer science. We had to learn um, how to use, you know, all those stars and dots and file names. So you can say, show me all JPEG files, show me all this, that, or files that just have the letters KB in them or whatever. Um, it, it honors a lot of that stuff. So I can say star KB and it'll give me every file that has KB in it. And then I found out they made it even nicer, and now I can just say KB, and it'll find KB in any file. So it's uh, it's it's been improved over the years. Um, it I love being able to sort by. I, I hope these other ones can do it. Maybe one of you guys could talk to this. I love being able to just show details view and sort by name, date, file type, fo folder it's in. Um, I use that all the time, and uh, find that really helpful when I'm trying to manage data for people or for myself even, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I'll also mention, since it was mentioned about the free commander, I'll just toss out something to look for that there is a um, commander, there's a couple of different commander uh, file managers that you can install. Uh, they're not pretty looking, they're just functional and do that. I, I think there's even one version that you can put four different windows or sections and be doing a lot of work if you're doing that. Um, and to answer Kevin's, yes, um, uh, the most of the file managers in Linux will let you uh, sort on that plus more. Uh, 
I always have on mine with detailed view, I also say I want to see the ownership and permissions because there are sometimes I've run into a problem that it won't let me copy something and I find out that I don't own where I was trying to go. So it's kind of good to know who owns certain folders and files uh, that you can do. Midnight Commander, that's what you're going to check up. Midnight Commander. Cool. Going, going, gone for file managers. All right. Uh, jumping now, one of the tasks that we do a lot is typing up things. Now, I'm not necessarily going to, because I, I, I put that in, in another uh, category down below, but a lot of us do text writing and, and um, letter writing. And so I, I was going to separate this into not including text editors because of the different levels of that. But I'm talking about something that you'd use to type up something that would, you know, you could have different fonts, and different colors, different sizes, uh, images added in. What, what do people use for a word processing uh, type of, of program? Back over to Orv again. Well, 100% LibreOffice. Since it since it split off from Open Office and Open Office before that, um, it's become quite good. Um, I don't worry too much about Windows compatibility since I live all in Linux, but the Windows compatibility continues to improve. It's like I don't know 99.9% .9 uh, compatible. Um, use Writer for uh, writing newsletter articles and stuff. All my presentations I use. Um, whatever the hell they call it uh, in, in labor office. Impress, thank you. <laughs> they even have a remote control for your uh, your smartphone if you're doing presentations. That's pretty cool. Um, they fixed a couple annoying bugs that bugged me recently, so I'm even happier with that. Starting to lose uh, LibreOffice draw a bit for diagrams because um, I suck at graphics. I got to get better at that. But pretty much LibreOffice all the way. Cal, what's your favorite word processing tool? Well, it's LibreOffice because I've used my word processors and Microsoft Word for decades. And uh, I've used like our LibreOffice since 2002 when it was OpenOffice. And then when it switched in 2011 to LibreOffice. And they've just, they have every kind of interface you want to mimic Windows or the old way. Uh, so getting used to the controls, but I'm just a prolific writer and I need a tool, a full featured tool. And LibreOffice Writer is just like Microsoft Word, a full featured writing tool. Mm -hmm. How about you, Dave? I'm, I'm pretty light in this in this area. I, I have used Writer and I have used Impress, um, but not very much. So I, I really don't have much to say here. Yeah, uh, I get to go back farther than both, of, both Orv and Cal because I started using Star Writer, which is where OpenOffice came from. And so that was back in the days that, that uh, I had to buy a CD for a few dollars and then I could install them all the computers at my school. So I was running Star Office and then Open Office and then I had to be forced to put Microsoft back on. Um, but yeah, as, as Cal said that uh, full featured is writer. Uh, but And I'll wait to tell you about one that's not quite as full featured that a lot of people like in case somebody else tells uh, shares that. But uh, a lot of times, you know, I've tried to find something similar to the old uh, Microsoft uh, writer program that was very simple. But it just seemed to be, why worry? Use writer because you've got everything in case you need it. My two cents worth, um, the, some member eons ago said, you know, can you demo writer at the club meeting? And I downloaded it to my uh, laptop and didn't look at it, went into the meeting 
And I taught Word for 22 years through adult ed, and there was only one thing that I couldn't find. It went, the brain went seamlessly to, okay, this is what happened. You know, you click on to do this, that, and the other thing. So I could jump to writer uh, with and calc with absolutely no problems at all. I still find impress strange, but, uh, and with the writer, you can use the old uh, Chinese menu, drop it down, or you can have it look like a ribbon so you can customize it how your eyes want to look at it. Howard, you're on. Yeah, um, I see that the uh, next several uh, items are all basically the same for me. Word processing, document reader, text editors, and note taking, and office suite. I use LibreOffice for all of those. Um, for document readers, sometimes I'll use a browser, but uh, generally LibreOffice will do all of those. Also, I noticed that we're only like four lines into the uh, the uh, note taking document and we're more than three quarters of the way through the hour. Right, but this lasts for two hours. Oh, okay. I, I, I thought it was only an hour hour presentation. No, nope. unfortunately, or, or a little bit longer. Oh, yeah. Um, or usually we finish it around 1130. Oh, I, unfortunately, I, uh, I had planned differently. I'm going to have to leave at noon. Not to worry, you will get a link to the recording. Sigurd. Yeah, some years ago on Windows, I moved away from um, Microsoft Office or Office 365 when I realized I needed to do a lot of work for Quaker Meeting and the license does not permit using um, the version of Office 365 that I had for nonprofits or churches or anything else without jumping through hoops that I wasn't ready to do. So I switched completely over to uh, LibreOffice, and I have used it on Windows and on Linux. It is a marvelous platform. I want to put in a plug for those of you who are able to and inclined to contribute to the people who make this software freely available to you. It's really important. I mean, you, you APCUG folks know that although you have a lot of volunteers, there are costs associated with running this kind of an organization. Could you imagine? <clears throat> and the same thing is true for those who make our software uh, that we so much love. So I put in a plug for LibreOffice. I have contributed to them, um, and I really like what they do. Thank you. Edward. I uh, decided to try something different on Linux, uh, free office. Oh. Anybody else tried that? I was running under, under Fedora, so. Okay. Thanks. George. Um, I didn't hear anybody say Google Docs. I mean, if you're sharing documents, you're in one of full suite uh, across multiple types of computers. Um, uh, it seems to me the obvious choice. Thank you. Anybody else use anything different? And I have the other thing to add to to that. Um, that oh, George, thank you because that answered a question that was in the chat. Somebody asked about that. If anybody was using, you know, the Google Suite, and I'm sure that there are some people that might even be using the the Microsoft because it being web based. Uh, the other one that I want to to make mention to you that you could put down your list to check out, if you do not need something as full featured as Writer there is a program called Abbey Word that is just strictly a word processing program, an excellent one. Uh, and I can't tell you what features it might not have that writer has, but there are people who say, I don't want that because it's huge. I have an older computer. I don't have as much resources. So I want something that has a little bit more than nothing. So check out uh, Abbey Word. Did somebody really send you a question? Uh, uh, yeah, 
Okay. <laughs> they didn't want to ask it. Yeah, I know, but. <clears throat> All right. Remember my as, statement as, about seniors and kindergartners. Yep. Uh, could you give me a, a really short version of why don't you guys like open office? What happened? Okay. Open office was bought by a company who wasn't really keen on open sourceness and such and the sharing of the stuff. So when that happened, the development team just got all up and left because they just quit. But because it's open source, they took the code for open office and redesigned it into LibreOffice. But that's what it was. It was definitely a uh, business practice that wasn't uh, liked by most of the people who were in favor of free and open source software. Um, open source has a team that's developing, but from what I read, it's a very interesting relationship. Anything that the open office developers create can be had by LibreOffice because LibreOffice, I guess, was the original and everything. But if the LibreOffice developers create something, it doesn't have to be given to OpenOffice. So there are things in LibreOffice that aren't in OpenOffice. But it was all a political thing and uh, that that's what happens. Since then, the open office program was sold to somebody else who was uh, more inclined to develop it the right way. Okay, so, so that's like Opera Vivaldi. Correct. And then when Corel uh, bought WordPerfect, they had absolutely nothing, no clue on what to do. And it sat stagnant for two years and Word took over the world. WordPerfect yep. is a much, much better word processing program. But Kevin. Yes, the main reason I use LibreOffice instead of OpenOffice, because I do use LibreOffice on my own system because I don't want to spend $500 for Office or a recurring subscription of $70 or $100 uh, for Office, um, is because LibreOffice allows me to save and open and update files in Microsoft Office format, all formats of Microsoft Office, where OpenOffice uh, allowed you to open the older style, like anything pre-Office 2007, you could open, update, and create new documents with OpenOffice, but uh, it wouldn't allow you to uh, update or create new documents in the newer format of, of Office. I say newer, <laughs> 2007, we're looking at, what's that, 15 years now, but still uh, a Word document, most of you probably know, and in .doc, and the newer format has DOCX. Mm -hmm. And without getting too technical, LibreOffice can open up anything in any of the X extended ones. Um, and the OpenOffice can open them, but it can't update them directly. Um, I would like to put in, I do use LibreOffice a lot. Um, on the pros and cons, uh, it can just do so much. I agree with everybody else. The negative for me with LibreOffice where I always prefer Word uh, is in labels. They have this lovely little template for all sorts of Avery labels, but when you go to try to make a second page of them, it just doesn't do it. It just, uh, in Word, if you have a label <coughs> and you're at the end of the last label and you hit tab, it just creates another page of the same stuff. In LibreOffice, you hit tab on that last label and it just creates a new blank sheet and you're not going to, if you've got more than one page full of labels, it just goes to heck in a handbasket. It just doesn't, it just doesn't do it. Um, I don't, I don't know if there's extensions in Linux that allow you to do that, but I haven't found anything yet for LibreOffice to do that. Um, also, another thing is because I use Word so much, I know so many of the keyboard shortcuts and LibreOffice does allow me to change those. Um, I haven't gotten as extensive as I wanted to in that area, but I can make keyboard shortcuts in LibreOffice that will mimic what's in Word because that's what I've been using for, you know, 15, 20 years. So thank you. John, thank you. next topic. Yeah. Somebody mentioned the fact that these were all kind of related, but I'm kind of going along with my window days 
when we did different things back in those days, you had a different software for each. So uh, the document viewer was one of those that in Windows, you know, we had to have a, a separate program for that. Uh, I will say that to shorten things down, that all the browsers will open PDFs uh, within themselves. But sometimes people want more control over uh, the PDFs. And so uh, the focus would be on what do you use you know, as a software program other than your browser to do PDFs? So uh, Orv, do you have something that you use instead of a browser? I do. Um, it's provided by KDE Plasma. It's Ocular, O-K-U-L-A-R. All I do is view them. I'm sure it has other capabilities, but it does what I need. Cal? Well, I use the, uh, the X reader, which is in Linux Command, but I also have, uh, so I will download a lot of PDFs, not just leave them in the browser. And then I will use a program called uh, PDF Ranger, which allows me to join several PDFs, cut out pages, so I can take several different PDFs about a topic and then cut and, cut and uh, reassemble it into uh, one PDF document and not have to look at excess things that was superfluous to my purpose. David, anything to? Oh, great information, Cal. <laughs> I'm going to have to look into that. Um, I've been using a program in Windows 7-Zip for years and years and years, and I know I can use that in Linux as well. So that's that's what I've been playing with. Typically, when I click on a zip on a on a PDF file, um, I'm sorry, 7-Zip. I got confused. I two different two different topics here. Um, anyway, typically when I've clicked on a PDF in Linux, I just use whatever comes up. So I, I don't do a lot of um, manipulation of PDF files. Yeah, yeah. I, I would agree on that, that um, it, it depends. And somebody else brought it up earlier. What are you going to do with it? If you're just going to read it, then, you know, the browser is probably not too bad of being able to read it. But if you ever want to do something with it, with extra tools, then uh, the X Reader is the new generation of a program called uh, Events, which was in the, the uh, GNOME and Atril. And so X Reader is just Mint's attempt to improve it and then make it so that it goes across all of the uh, uh, Mint programs. Uh, but Ocular would, would have been my second choice because uh, it gave you things that you could do with, you know, thumbnails and see like that. So, uh, yeah. Others? So like, like highlighting a, a, a line of text, for example. Right. And uh, some of them even let you do a little bit of editing, I think. Hmm. Howard, your turn. Uh, yeah, uh, since Ocular came up, uh, I, I want to mention that at work I use uh, Ocular uh, because I was in um, using CentOS and that was what was available. Actually, there were three different available and I don't remember the other two because I didn't like them. Uh, so uh, I just used Ocular for, for reading uh, PDF documents. Anybody else? Andy. Again, um, because they're both cross-platform, um, I use, it's, it's not necessarily a reader, but for manipulating, for playing around with PDFs, I use PDF SAM, sort and merge, for extracting pages or for putting a bunch of individual PDFs into a single PDF, and um, Boxit Reader, I happen to like on both platforms. Um, a lot of times I'm looking at three, four, five different PDFs at the same time. I like the tabbed interface. 
some of the okay. tools that they have there. Yeah. We have That's somebody in the chat box that uses Fox at Reader. Good old standby. And I checked to see if my favorite free one, but it doesn't work with Linux, but it recommended Fox at Reader. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think that the, the tab part was uh, what some people like, whereas the web-based one will just show you the one. Uh, a lot of these standalone ones can have tabs, so you can have a number of different ones uh, showing. David. <clears throat> um, one of my colleagues in Australia is very keen on LibreOffice and uh, made much of the fact that in Libra Draw you can modify PDS to some extent. So that's just a comment on on actually editing a PDF in Libra Draw. That's all. That's good because somebody else forgot to mention that you know that's in 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 there because. Uh, a lot of times, you know, some of those PDF readers can't do editing, but Draw can let you make some changes. It's not the full-fledged PDF editor program, but there are ones out there that you can check on. Okay, uh, let's jump real quick. Uh, not too many people are programmers, but does anybody have uh, a program they use for very simple, old-fashioned Windows uh, notebook, which was just nothing more than a glorified uh, typewriter just for uh, doing a little bit quick text besides uh, what comes with it. Every program that I know of in Linux comes with a, a, a text editor. Any of our team have anything that they use special? Yeah, John, there are two text editors in KDE Plasma, KWrite and Kate, which is hmm. KDE Advanced Text Editor. Um, K writes pretty much the vanilla notepad like stuff, uh, um, but it has some nice features. You can highlight something and go all caps, all lowercase, and or first letter, you know, semi word processor. Kate, on the other hand, has a lot of tools that you'd find in an IDE, uh, integrated development environment, you know, highlight starts and stops of um, uh, different stanzas for different. Uh, programming languages. If you program in Python, it knows Python syntax. If you do, oh, I don't know, Rust maybe, um, I'm sure it covers it, it can do that. So um, I don't do a lot of programming, but when I do do a little bit in Bash, it's very comfortable showing me my mistakes. Yeah, so uh, Nano is very good if you've got to make some command line edits to this very lightweight and uh, uh, G edit or X edit is the uh, known version of what uh, Arv was talking about. And there are lots of uh, idle type. Uh, you can use Sublime Text or Visual Studio Code, or if you're going to program that, give the indentations based on your uh, programming language. Okay, over. I'll I'll pass it over. The the only addition I have to those I, I I've used Kate quite a bit and and uh, I like the fact that it it will do uh, highlighting and also it has the ability to open a um, terminal window at the same time in the same window so you can you can be writing some code and just test it right right there and then without going to another screen. Um, which I kind of like. I also use Notepad QQ, which hasn't been mentioned. Um, I I find that pretty familiar because I've used it in Windows, and it was it was also installable, and in which I installed in Linux. And um, it does it does text highlighting as well, and uh, line numbering, and um, it's got a lot of features, and it's very configurable. You said Notepad QQ. Yeah, QQ, like queen, queen. Okay, because uh, I know in Windows we had Notepad++, plus plus, so oh, yeah, maybe it's a be very one. similar. Okay. Yeah, very similar. Okay, <laughs> moving on, Judy. I love it, John. You're taking notes. You're learning stuff that you didn't know before. <laughs> well, it goes into presentations. 
<laughs> that is way cool. Uh, Kurt. Wrong button. Uh, had a question. I In the world of Windows, I use Notepad++, and I like it because of all the languages that it supports. Things like HTML and CSS, it'll take and find matching parentheses and, and, and things like that. So the question may have been answered, but does Note, uh, Notepad QQ do that? Mute. Unmute. Um, I'm sorry. I think it does, but I I don't. I haven't used it in a while, so I can't really remember. Um, I just loaded it, and it's got a tab for languages, and looks like it's got a bazillion of them. It, it does have a bazillion of op options. So yes, you can configure it to do a lot of stuff. Thank you. Now that's what we're looking for. Somebody's found something that would be Orv. And he just has it already downloaded and is looking at it. So that is that makes my day, so to speak. <clears throat> George, you're on. I think you guys are hiding the truth. You're all really using VI. <laughs> I use VI out of habit because I used to be a sysadmin and it was the only text editor you knew would be on every system you logged Absolutely. in. Absolutely. And that's why everybody has to know how to use VI. <laughs> I mean, it may not be your editor of choice. It is. But, you know, VI and said will get you by if you really have a problem, right? It will. It's, it's genuinely user hostile. But, oh, yeah. Um, Fortunately, for most simple stuff, there's only a dozen commands you need to know, you know. Yeah, when we were programming at uh, GTE, when it was GTE and not Verizon, um, we did the whole central office switch in VR. So. Well, I'm and sorry. Then we can also do Vim, you know, for those of us who aren't uh, all the way to VI, <laughs> VI and modern Vim. So other than that, I use Leaf and uh, oh, whatever yeah. is on those Whatever is on the system that I install, I just use that because there's not a lot of differences between these simple editors. It is well, unfortunate that Notepad++ doesn't have a version on Linux. I'm not really sure why they chose not to go that route. Could have been closed source and they can't make a copy, but it'll be interesting to find out from anybody that does Notepad++ and compare it to Notepad GG or QQ. <laughs> On uh, uh, VI and VIM, I used to play with them a little bit in my earlier days with uh, Linux, but uh, uh, I got away from them because they were uh, uh, just too ornery uh, uh, and too <laughs> ancient. I switched to uh, uh, Nano, which is also built into a lot of the Linuxes. It's a lot easier uh, uh, to use and uh, uh, maintain. Uh, simple scripts of code uh, uh, that you uh, normally uh, don't want a bigger package for. Andy. Um, if I'm looking at HTML stuff on Linux, there's a neat editor called Bluefish. Oh, Bluefish yeah. text editor. Um, so I've used that. I also like Kurt was saying, Notepad++ is my go-to editor, and I run it on Linux. It, it fires up beautifully under Wine. So I've been running that for years with absolutely no problem. For a quick and dirty editor, Judy, I just shot you a link in a private chat. If you copy, copy and paste that into the address bar, your browser makes a great quick and dirty Notepad. Oh. Huh. Cool. Got that right here. If you, you know what? Uh, let me copy that and send that to, how do I send it to everybody? You can't. You, you don't. That's, it, that's why Judy collects everything and sends oh, okay. everything out okay. for the follow-up. Yeah, Judy, if you try, try copy that from data down to the right carrot. Yeah, I will. In, it, it opens up a blank page and if you're in a tabbed browser, it's very quick and dirty. You don't even need another application. Cool. Yeah. John will be writing that down after I send the follow-up material <laughs> over. Okay. Andy? Got to lower Talk his hands. John, 
All righty, going, going, gone on. Yeah, a quick thing uh, in note taking. Yes, you take notes in um, all of these editors, but the reason I put that separate is that if you wanted to be able to uh, access notes cross platform and anywhere, does anybody have uh, a program that they use to uh, access their stuff uh, when they're not at home? or on a different device? I do. Yeah. Uh, it's it's uh, platform neutral, but keep, keep.google.com. Um, there's a app for every cell phone out there. And since you're synchronized with Google, um, any notes you put uh, in your phone in a little keep article will show up in the browser and you can modify it bi-directionally. Um, has bullets, numbers, stores, uh, photos, along with, um, I'd be lost without it. I, 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 I'll be out and about and put something in keep. And when I get back in front of my computer, I'll open it up and in the browser and uh, expand it or move it around or whatever. It's my go-to for notes. Cal? Well, on the other end, uh, there's all these, um, if you're doing, complex notes and whatever. I actually store everything in impress uh, and take pictures and snapshots and uh, links. And it's kind of complicated, but that, that's a one format that then I can move around as a file anywhere I want and uh, open on my phone or LibreOffice, et cetera. Dave? Well, I'm the same as Orb here in this particular one. I, I use Google Keep. And, and uh, like he said, out and about and take a note in a grocery store or a hardware store or whatever and have it at home when you can sit down at the computer and research stuff. So I, I put links in there. I put notes, comments, pictures. Okay. This works. Well, I'll, I'll share and say, de-Google de fi yourself, guys. Yeah. Uh, go check out Joplin. Joplin is an open source note-taking program that works on my computer, my laptop, and my phone. And so that way I put my prescriptions in my Joplin. When I go to the doctors, I get my phone out, get Joplin and say, here's all my prescriptions. Uh, so check out Joplin as an option for cross-platform open source note keeping. Hmm. Interesting. Andy. It's, uh, not, it's considerably more than just quick and dirty notes, but another cross-platform uh, application is called Cherry Tree. And it, you can, I don't know, I don't even know what the, upper limit is, but um, you create all kinds of little notes in there. You can put, you can create tables and things like that. You have, a, you have to take a look at it. It's just called Cherry Tree, but it runs on uh, Linux and Windows. And uh, I don't think there's anything on, that runs on a phone, but I have all kinds of uh, junk in there. Uh, you know, the little snippets that you want to save when you're doing your browsing or you're doing research on something, you want to put everything together in some sort of a hierarchy. It's just a neat little app. Yeah, it's a great, uh, it organizes uh, text. It's great for text. Cool. Over have to you, you David. Used it, Cal? Cal, have you used it, he asked? Have I used what? Cherry tree. Yes. Uh, I've actually taken a lot of emails and turned them into text and organized a lot of email. It, it's, you take text files and you organize them. That's what I use it for. Thank you. Over to you, David. 
Thanks. I'm embarrassed because I just want to jump back to browsers for a moment and okay. uh, mention something which might be important to some people. Opera uh, was actually sold to Chinese interests back in, I think, 2016. So mm -hmm. for those who are concerned about security, I thought I'd better mention that. That's all. Thank oh, you. Cool. I was going to mention that, too. I think that's when people stopped liking it. Any other discussion about note taking? Moving on, John. Okay, uh, I think we've covered it enough, but I'll let anybody who uh, doesn't use LibreOffice as their office suite to share what office suite they might be using. If there's anybody else out there, because I think it's unified with most of us doing LibreOffice. Okay. Oh, Rosalie wants to share. Well, I don't use Linux, so I'm here to see what I can do because I use um, Office a lot. Does anybody know if there's a spreadsheet program that does, um, you know, the basic filtering, uh, pivot tables, um, a little more advanced Excel things? Did you take a look at uh, Google Stocks, their uh, program? Unless they've really updated lately, they don't do a lot of that. And have you tried the uh, LibreOffice version Sheets. of Excel? Calc, Calc. No, I, I haven't. That's why I'm asking if anybody actually knows if it does those things. Yes, it does. The LibreOffice? LibreOffice does tables. It does um, it just, uh, pivot tables, mm. all kinds of it's, – it's it does just about everything functionally that uh, Excel does. The only thing you got to watch is any macro – you can't transfer macros from one – from Excel to, to Calc, so you have to create your own macros – uh in that uh calc spreadsheet and that's because of, of uh, legal reasons okay and that's similar creating those macros are similar to what you they would have do. macros that you can create but you can't transfer an existing excel one over to LibreOffice. okay and the excel files will open okay in LibreOffice. oh yeah Thank you very much. Yeah, Rosalie, the, my, my background would say LibreOffice is free. Download it. Mm -hmm. Since you know Excel, give it the run and then get back with us and say, here's what it can't do. Because I know that there are some things that LibreOffice may not be able to do that Microsoft Office can do. But I've never found that because I don't do that sort of stuff. So download it, it's free. Open up your programs and see what it does. Okay. Let us know at the April meeting. Thank you, I'll try that out. Thank you. Remember, I know where you live. <laughs> Over to George. Hi, Rosalie. Um, you said you didn't find success in Google Sheets because I have done so much in Google Sheets. I, I know what you mean about needing a good spreadsheet. To me, it's the uh, Swiss army knife of, of, of producing stuff that you, that you need to do. We do our membership cards with QR codes and all that stuff in Google Sheets. And um, I've written accounting programs for organizations in Google Sheets. It has a powerful query language if you want to use it as a database. I don't know if it does pivot tables, but it sure does an awful, everything I need. Okay, I'll go back out and look at those too. The last time I looked at them, they just didn't have enough of what I needed though, but I'll look at those also. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, when you do, a, when you do a, a, a copy and a paste, you can, it's not a pivot table, but you can, you can uh, copy and then do a transform when you do the paste so that it's inverted the ro rows and columns. Uh, I believe, but. Uh doesn't Google Sheets have add-ons? Oh, yeah. It's got all kinds of add-ons. Yeah, so so you, if you find an add-on, 
Yeah. Uh, I thought it did pivot tables, but I won't swear to it. Yeah, um, there's, that's one of the advantages of, of, of the Google uh, Docs uh, suite is that it, there are add-ons. And I've used the mass mailer add-on for um, doing mail merge type of things that you could do in Office, uh, Microsoft Office. I can do a mail merge uh, emailing to our members um, right within uh, my Google account and using Sheets and things like that. Yeah, Doc, there's, there's quite a few add-ons. Docs does pivot tables. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Mm -hmm. You mean Sheets? I know. <laughs> <laughs> I got the Sheets, I got the Calc, I got the Excel, you know? <laughs> Where am I? Any other answers? You guys, the same people are sharing. We have over 70 people here. There's got to be people who use, I mean, thank you, Rosalie, for joining the, the crowd here. Appreciate that. But some of you guys, you know, you must use other things or even like John said, ditto. So we know that a lot of people like, you know, the same thing and maybe we should give it a try. John, you're on. Uh, yes, hi, this is uh, John from Pittsburgh. Um, I've been playing with a uh, relatively new uh, suite called OnlyOffice. If you go to only onlyoffice.com, um, what I like about it is the fact that it not only is it um, cross-platform for Windows, Mac, and Linux, it also is has mobile apps for Android and uh, Apple iOS. So, um, you know, maybe somebody out there would like to Give that a try, but uh, yeah, only onlyoffice.com is the website, and it is there are several Linux distros that it is available to be installed on. So just thought I'd throw that out. And you can configure it in a enterprise mode with servers and all of that. So it's not just a standalone. You can use it as a team. That's kind of its forte. Thanks, John. Uh, Kevin. Unmute, please. I thought I had just clicked on it, sorry. Um, I just did a quick check, Rosalie, and I saw that if you uh, go to Calc, which is the spreadsheet program in LibreOffice, it's uh, you click on data, pivot table, create, and that should give you the, the beginnings of the pivot table. I don't know any details beyond that. And thank you to the previous person who talked about um, only Office. I look for, forward to that because I'm not really satisfied with the word processors I can get on my phone. Um, but uh, so thank you for that. If I'm going to check that out. Cool. Thank you. Going, going, gone on this topic. Okay. What we're going to do now is uh, I'm going to combine and let people talk about audio and video. Uh, both players and editors and just lump those all kind of together. Uh, and basically, you know, it, it may be easier to say, what do you use if you don't use what just comes with your distro? You know, what, what's your favorite? Um, had to check to see we we're, we're losing my my team members cal anything special that you use for audio and video stuff yeah for video um of course katie caden live is an old standby but it often has lots of problems a simpler version is now called shotcut which is cross-platform and however what i really use because i'm not that big of a videographer is something called lossless cut which is one of these programs which just snips off uh, parts of an MP4 file without having to render it. So it just chops it off and you just use, you rename another file and it instantly, there it is. Hmm. So that, and I don't do any audio stuff, so I'll pass on that. Mm -hmm. You don't listen to music? Well, I use the standard stuff. Okay. <laughs> uh, Cal, request for you to say the name again. 
lossless cut. Lossless cut. Yep. Yeah. Uh, Dave, anything on audio uh, video? Well, I, as, as far as um, video editing, I, I don't do any of that really. Um, but I use Audacity as my audio player cutter. Um, I also use it for creating MP3 files and so forth. The only issue I'm having in Linux with Audacity is I can't I can't listen to a audio file while I'm recording it, and so I'm frustrated with that part of it. Um, as far as any others, I have not tried any others. Yeah, and a video player, I use VLC. Right, Num number one, probably all around. Um, second to the Audacity, I use that a lot to convert my old eight track or uh, cassette tapes <laughs> to uh, digital. Uh, but I don't remember. Usually, I think I just set those to record, and I wanted to do something else. So I don't uh, remember listening to, to those as we went. Um, the other thing for audio player is, uh, even though uh, rhythm box is what comes standard with a lot, uh, I seem to kind of want things that let you do a little bit more. So there's one program. It's an old one called Clementine mm -hmm. as, as the make. And then because of the way Linux open source works, somebody took Clementine and uh, m modified it a little bit more. And we now have a new one that's called Strawberry. And so these are two that would be very, uh, very similar to an iTunes program for the Apple people that you can do a lot with creating playlists and uh, all that sort of stuff. So if you're into a lot of, uh, you know, music, uh, check out Clementine and uh, Strawberry. Uh, the other, the other uh, video editing, uh, and they get kind of tricky because of names, uh, or mentioned Shotcut, there's Open Shot, which is probably kind of like the, the top one along with Caden Live uh, on uh, the Linux uh, platform. And Caden Live and Open Shot are cross platform, so everybody can use them too. So, John, one, one yeah. thing you mentioned about Audacity is that you, you copied your A track tapes. And, and I, I've been doing a lot of record albums, and I like to be able to monitor what I'm recording because some of them are so scratchy or skips. If I don't monitor that, there's no way I'm going to know that it's got all those skips in there. And what I can't remember since it's been a while is whether there's an option to turn on a monitor while yeah. you're uh, export, you know, uh, saving that. Yeah. All right. Let's move on to some others. Mike, you're on. Yeah, um, I had recently a problem downloading some uh, webinar files where when they downloaded, they split into the video portion and the sound portion. And uh, I wanted to stitch them back together. And uh, I was put on to Blackmagic's DaVinci uh, Resolve. Perfect. And I found that excellent. And I believe it runs on Linux as well. I'm a bit of a newbie on Linux, but uh, there's free and paid versions. But um, yeah, that, that was an excellent way to uh, you know, synchronize the sound with the audio so I didn't get any lip sync problems and everything. It was, it was very easy to use. Good. The only, the only reason I didn't mention uh, DaVinci Resolve is that it wasn't open source, but I've used that when I was helping my son do some audio editing and stuff like that. So uh, you, you can download that for uh, Linux, plus the other ones we mentioned. Great, thanks. Um, John. Yeah, I just wanted to mention, uh, I used to use Audacity and um, they recently got caught uh, phoning home and uh, they got in a bunch of trouble for that. And so the, some of the developers left that project and created one called Tenacity. 
and that's the one I'm currently using. And I'll put a link in the chat for Judy, but it's uh, tenacityaudio.org is the um, is the website, and uh, that's the one I'm currently using. So, but it's basically you know it's it's a fork of Audacity, and the, some of the key developers of Audacity went and created this new version of Audacity called Tenacity. So cool. Thanks, John, because I, I remember that going on. And when it happened uh, a while ago, it didn't bother me because I knew that somebody would fork it off and we would have one that would get back to the true open source uh, concept. And so I'm glad to hear that because then we'll tell um, everybody that was using Audacity to give it a try and uh, maybe they've made some improvements like open our labor office did open office and um, a couple of these others. Great. Okay. Any uh, other comments about this? Nope. On to your list. All right. Well, let's, let's uh, combine and talk about graphics. Uh, a lot of people have a lot of pictures that they have on their uh, computers. They need to organize them. They need to view them. They need to edit them. What do we have out there that people are using? Uh, we, we definitely have the programs that come with your um, distro itself. Uh, what are people doing? And this is where, you know, a lot of us don't. There are a lot of people that don't do photo editing and organizing. But if you do, share with everybody what you do uh, for that. Uh, Cal, you, you do any of that stuff? Okay, so I do a lot of photos. And <clears throat> the only photo organizer I've used at any extent is Digicam. It's an editor, a good editor, and uh, an organizer or an album generator. In general, though, I found that every I do all my photos manually with file management because anytime I put them in a photo organizer, it doesn't translate to another photo organizer. So it's got its own data. Each one has their own database. So it just frustrates me to no end. Um, as far as any more advanced stuff, uh, GIMP, if you have the time to learn it, uh, does everything Photoshop does, but it is very difficult to learn uh, because just like Photoshop is, I think, if you're going to do sophisticated photo editing. Good. Dave, do you do any of that sort of stuff? I do a little bit. Um, I have not done anything in the Linux world with with that sort of photo organizing or editing, so I have no real comment there. Yeah, I want to be. I'm an editor wannabe. I want to edit videos. Don't have time. Uh, but in in the, uh, uh, the the graphics world, there was a program that started out in the old days called I of Gnome. E O G was the the program and that was the big video uh, viewer and it went through a lot of different uh, changes. Uh, now I have uh, went to, or the distro went to I of Mate, went to EOM and then they've changed it and now uh, Mint trying to keep its X thing has PIX, P-I-X, which mm. is the good viewer. Uh, but as Cal or uh, Orv mentioned, I'll go back for, for his place since he had to leave. Uh, the uh, Gwyn View was the program he uses to do his photo viewing. And there's a cross platform program called Nomax that is a pretty good one. What other people use? Over to George. So we have a fairly active photo group within our computer club. And uh, when COVID came, before COVID, we used to arrive with our thumb drives of the photos that we'd taken and put them up on the TV screen, plugging into a computer or something like that. When COVID came, we moved uh, more towards shared albums in Google Photos. And I like the Google Photos editor. It's, it's fairly simple. I mean, you can use uh, Snapseed if, 
if you want to do something more. But um, in terms of sharing, there are some downsides to the Google Photo album. I mean, there's a lot of upsides. People, our, our novice people can upload photos to the album. They eventually figure it out. That you don't have to be doing it for them. But they do have to have a Google account. And when you're adding people to an album, it's really, and most of these people have a second address, right? It's really hard to see what the email address is that, that has been enabled as a contributor. They don't show it as, a, as an email address. They just show the name. And this is something that I find very frustrating. Maybe uh, our, our Google Photo uh, friends can uh, help me with this, but I, I don't think so. So, but as terms of an organizer, I've been using Google Photos ever since uh, um, Picasso was deprecated and it, it works good for me. Good. I would say that that sounds like a question for Geeks on Tour with Google Photos. And yes, and I was gonna ask George, have you ever had them give a presentation to your group? I think, I think we have. Um, I know I've asked the question to, uh, to Geeks on Tour, but I can't remember what their answer was. I think they said they were looking. Oh, they'll, they'll give it. But with your yeah. active photo, so you definitely should have them give a presentation every year. Yeah. Sure. Well, we, we share the APSUG uh, and, and um, also the Tech for Seniors links where they have done some presentations. I know, but this is for your group. Well, I'm always and embarrassed because I'm sometimes specifically just, what you want them to do. I'm always afraid of having only four people to turn up. That's work. okay. <laughs> yeah, they'll do it. Those of us who are with the Speakers Bureau realize this day and age, sometimes we get a gazillion and sometimes we don't. Yeah, okay. And you okay. don't need to worry about that. Yeah. Okay, I'll ask. Any other discussion? Onward, John. Okay. Uh, one of the big things that Judy and I are pushers for is when you have problems, take a picture of it. Because when you try to describe something, you can't always describe it. Uh, especially when we people said a message popped up on my screen or a warning popped up and we ask them, well, what did it say? Well, I think it was, that doesn't do any good because what you think it says may not be exactly what it says. So the next big topic is uh, things that you need for recording that stuff in terms of a screen capture program. You know, what do you use? Or if you don't use you might want to think about it because, boy, you're able to take a picture of your screen and then save it. And if you have the right program, you can edit it. Uh, Cal, you do anything with, with screen capturing? for? I do a million screen captures a month, I think. Uh, I generally use what's the distribution, whether I'm in KDE or GNOME, usually in GNOME uh, or in so it's, it's easy to take a screen capture. And then what I always do is I move them to impress because that's where I keep my notes and everything. So I can have several screens in the same frame and I can put annotations and so forth and then take it as a PDF and send it to somebody. So that's kind of my workflow. Uh, but the normal screen capture that I've seen generally takes the whole screen, the active window, or a, a segment. And um, unfortunately, uh, and I've used a couple others at times in order, sometimes when you have to capture a menu or something, I forget the names of them, there's a couple other, but I've, I've given up and just taken what comes with the distribution and then edit it kind of offline, if you will. John? They, oh, yeah? Is there a snipping tool feature for Linux? Oh, yeah. That's what I'm talking about. That's what he's talking about. Right. 
It's called yeah, screen it's, it's, screen capture or screen. It, it's it says screenshot. Generally, if you look, if you type screenshot or screen capture, and they have names, you know, they all have a program name. But generally, in the menu, it's called screenshot nine times out of ten. So you can actually zero in on something and get a plus sign and just capture part of what's on the screen. Yeah, you Correct. capture it, and I always copy the image over to another program. You can save it as a as a PNG file, or you can move it, and I always move it to another program where I do further editing and manipulation. Thank you, Dave. Any? So, in in uh, yeah, thank you, John. Uh, in in Linux, I have not done any screen capturing at this point, so I have nothing to add there. Good. Um, I want something more. Uh, years ago, I created a number of different teaching manuals or teaching guides for our uh, computer class for senior programs. And I just went crazy taking screenshots. But I want more than screenshots. I want to be able to annotate them and uh, mark them up. Mm -hmm. And so Cal says he throws those into Impress. And Impress does have some artistic tools in it. But I used to use a program that was just, to me, great called Shutter. And not only did it take the picture, but then it opened it up into an editor. But like in Linux, that program kind of went dormant for a while. And just recently, I've heard that somebody has picked up the recipe and going crazy with it. The program that I really like right now that I'm going crazy with is called KSNP. And it's a cross-platform program too. So, uh, you know, Dave can try it out in Windows and then try it out in Linux. And it does the natural full screen active window or rectangle so that you can cut out exactly what you want. And then it opens up it into an editor where I have the full thing like you would in, you know, a paint program, whatever, where I can draw arrows, I can make circles, I can put in text boxes. KSNP even lets me uh, uh, add numbering. So I can show first step, second step, third step. Uh, great program uh, for, for doing that. Uh, there are other programs out there too, but I really like the, the uh, KSNP because the other one they talk about, I have trouble using, and that's just me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I bet John's going to answer a question for me. Over to you, John, from Pittsburgh. Um, yeah, the one um, I use, right now I'm using um, PC Linux OS distro, and the, the built-in screen capture program for that is a one called Spectacle. And it's pretty, it's pretty um, feature rich. So there's a lot of things that, like John was mentioning about doing annotations and stuff like that. That's all part of that spectacle program. So um, I would recommend that. I don't know if you, what other distros you can install that on, but uh, the one that came with PC Linux is is very good. So it's a KDE standard. That okay. All right. Very good. Yeah, I, I just installed the PC Linux, so I I don't know about any other ones or you know whether that's a standard for that distro or not. So, did you which which PC Linux did you do the KDE one? KDE, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's really yeah. nice new one, yeah. So that probably does it. Uh, so the good question that John brought up was I don't know if which distro can. The way you need to do it for everybody is go to your distro software store that comes with the computer. And if it's listed in there, it's been checked out and it's fine for you to install on your version of, of Linux. If it's not in there, it might be in the second level that we have of software that's good for Linux, but maybe hasn't been 100% tested out. And you can find that you know, in your Synaptic uh, program. Thirdly, you go out on the internet and see what they say. If they say they have a version for Debian, then that means the Debian, the Ubuntu, the Mints, and all those. If they have the one for RPM, that means all for the Fedora family. So uh, the best bet is if you want to know if it's for, you know, for your distro, check your software store. So good, good on that one. And John? 
But Which no, John? I'm sorry, John from Pittsburgh. Yeah, yes, short, go ahead. Short John. Uh, John from Pittsburgh, will you please ch uh, check your chat box? I had a question for you and I thought maybe you were answering that. Yeah, I missed that, Judy, sorry. No, but maybe you can jump back in later and give us an answer. Any any time. Okay, this is going well. Uh, yes. the, next, oh. the next one is related to that. What about live, not just a stagnant screenshot? What if you needed to record what's going on in your desktop? Like right now with Zoom, we're recording this. But what about if it's something you wanna, uh, don't go online and use a big program like Zoom. What do you do for recording uh, actions on your screen? Cal, do you do any of that too? Kazam, K-A-Z-A-M. Simple, does it, comes out with an MP4 or whatever, I forget. And and then you can go to lossless cut and chop off the front and the back that you don't want. <laughs> and there it is. Perfect. I'm glad you mentioned that. I was hoping somebody would. Uh, David, anything? on? on... No, I, I have not done that at all. Yeah. I, I keep thinking I'm going to do that because I can record stuff that our club members want to know. How do you do something? And saying, well, gee, just make a recording and then keep it in a file where they can, you know, watch it and do it up. Yeah, uh, I agree with that. I, I just, I, I keep thinking I want to do that and I just don't get around to it. I'll, I'll save my, these two things I have here because I know that Kurt's got a, a comment to make on that. Yeah, what's wrong with Zoom? And I, I mean this in all, all sincerity. Uh, a free Zoom account will allow you to take and have a, a one member Zoom um, meeting, turn on, on uh, share screen or, you know, and start capturing whatever you wanna do. Mm -hmm. you, can, you can pause it, uh, you can, you know, do, do whatever you, whatever you want, wanna do. Uh, a week ago, I took and I recorded uh, a, a demonstration. One of the groups I belong to has a mantra, don't do live demos, uh, which is, I think- Oh, well, we do them all the time. Yeah. Uh, actually, I was doing one where I was, I was installing Raspbian OS and then some other stuff. Okay. So that takes time while you're going through the process and nobody wants to watch a uh, progress bar go, go on during a, during a presentation, but Zoom works for, great for that. You record locally, so you have no limit on how much you can have. You don't have to have a paid account in order to do it, and it's something that we all should have some familiarity with doing just because we attend these meetings off soapbox. Oh, that's, that's, that's a good one. The reason I had said no kind of on that is because of what our presenter for our uh, uh, plug now for our Saturday Safari next Saturday. There won't be a Wednesday workshop because we're doing a Saturday Safari. Um, and he said the problem is that Zoom records their videos at a different frame rate than what's normal. And so he said that caused problems when he was trying to use those videos in kind of like an editing or whatever he was using. Uh, so as long as, as ever, nobody's gonna mess with them, I, I guess it's gonna be okay. The, the other one that goes the next step up from Kazam, Alba Crab, Kazam, um, is the simple screen recorder because that would be one step maybe above what Kazam, Kazam can do. Um, and I guess that's probably the one I was most familiar with, but then I found out about Kazam. Uh, and if you are really into the biggie stuff, the program that you wanna look into is uh, OBS, Open Broadcast Studio, open source program. And that's what, if you ever watch the Geeks on Tour, they use that. And a number of the people who are doing the big um, uh, videos on YouTube that are, that are the ones that make, you know, one every day or so, uh, a lot of them use that, but that's the one that would have a little bit more of a learning curve. So 
or a cow is recommending Kazam. And uh, if, if that doesn't do enough, give a try to simple screen recorder. And of course, a simple plain one uh, would be doing your Zoom one and talking to yourself. Yes, we and, do that anyway. Yeah, we do that sometimes. Anybody else have anything on screen recorders? This goes to other things that we do about backup, but we're not gonna talk about backup. Uh, I will tell you, we would like any Linux people to be joining us on the 30th when we do our backup, big backup workshop, because it's the National Backup Day, uh, because we want Windows people to hear about what we do to backup just like what Windows people do. So if you do something backing up of data, images, and whatever, please join on the 30th so we can have you share what Linux does for backup. But how about uh, being able to access stuff and backing up into the cloud? Anybody use any uh, cloud service for backing up files? Open um, that up to either Cal or Dave first. Go ahead, Cal. No, I'm going to pass. Okay, well, I, I the only comment I have there is I use Dropbox and Google Drive. Those are my two uh, internet-based backups. Good. Uh, Dave, they, our, our Bill, Bill will throw in. Don't forget OneDrive because you can use OneDrive because it's you know for Linux. And I, I'll let Bill know. It's interesting. There is a uh, uh, an an app for Linux that will link to OneDrive so that you can have more of a client on your computer than just using the uh, directly up to the cloud. Uh, the other program that I, I will mention um, is pCloud. And there's a new one called Internext, I-N-T-E-R-N-X-T. I'm still having some trouble with it because it's the new guy on the block. And it may be my fault because I'm testing out both pCloud and Intranex. And I have iDrive that is not the best for Linux. It oh. does not have a client for Linux. I have to do everything web-based. And with the web-based, it's not as easy to use as pCloud because right now I have a shared folder in pCloud where I can access files, I can access them directly, save to them, go to my other computer, you know, re, uh, retrieve them. Whereas with the iDrive, I have to download something to my computer, then I have to upload it back. With, with the uh, pCloud, all I have to do is just you know, save. So I would say recommending it, it uh, as, as a choice uh, works fine with Linux. You just download a, and it creates a folder and you just share with that. pCloud. John from Pittsburgh, my good buddy next door. Uh, yeah, John, thanks. Um, I recently started using um, uh, cloud storage called Ice Drive. It's icedrive.net. Um, and the reason I started using that is it's, uh, it's a free service, 10 gigabytes, but it, all the files are encrypted. So, um, and it's... Um, it's cross-platform, and also um, uh, there is a uh, web-based. You can there's a web-based version. There's a uh, client for um, Windows, Linux, and Mac, and then there's also a mobile version for uh, Android and uh, Apple platforms uh, on the mobile side. So. Um, and it's a free free account. So all you have to do is create it, you know, create your account, and then you can send files up there, and those will be uh, encrypted. So cool. just you know, there are many there are many services out there, but I like the fact that you know they're saying that you know encryption is involved in this particular service. So I'm sure there probably might be other ones out there. I don't know, but I just happened to stumble across this one. So good. Okay. I'll put a, I'll drop a uh, link. Absolutely. Into I'm going to jump over the remote and come back to that because I want to oh. jump to, oh, 
Andy. Oh, Andy. Um, I, I've used Dropbox, and I have no idea what incantations I went through to get uh, OneDrive and Google Drive up and running under Linux. It's not, I don't remember it being anywhere near as being intuitive or easy to set up. And there, I don't, it, it's just too, uh, I have it on one machine, but it's, it's not easy. Uh, for cross-platform cloud storage, um, I like Mega. And uh, I know both Mega and pCloud have a native Linux client and a native Windows client. And that's what I look for. Dropbox is, is easy to set up, but Dropbox, you're limited to, I think it's three computers. And, you know, if you're playing around with a bunch of different computers or going to different places, you run out of, uh, you know, you have to uninstall it on one and set up another one and things like that. So uh, Mega and uh, pCloud, because of the native, uh, their native Linux client, get my vote for cloud storage. Hmm. Yeah, good ones on that one. And the uh, thing about uh, Dropbox, that is good. Um, uh, an issue along with uh, Evernote. Evernote has a limit in its free version as to how many devices you can ha you know, access with your notes. Uh, I do have Dropbox, and I, you know, because I have to mention since I talked about Joplin, uh, uh, Joplin has to store its st stuff somewhere, and Dropbox is one of the places that it can connect. So I do have a Dropbox just for Joplin. Don't use it for anything else so that it can upload. I haven't checked recently to see if Joplin, what else it can do. Um, so I only do you know, Dropbox for that. Andy. Oh, sorry, Judy. I looked up. No, nope, I'm done. Oh, OK, good. I'll put the hand down since you're on your phone. Um, I want to jump right now to one thing that's been a big discussion topic in Linux in general is protection. And I, if if uh, uh, Orv would be here, I know he would say nothing. But I know there's some others that, uh, you know, we have talked about the fact that most of us, I won't say all of us, but most of us in Linux does very little with, with uh, worrying about protection software because it doesn't really affect the desktop user very much. Um, programs that are written for uh, at attacking have to be run and nothing runs by itself in Linux. You have to give uh, permission. So if, if something does run, it's because you okayed it. Um, also, with, with the Linux being open source, you, you can't hide things very well. And when something does get in there, it usually gets fixed up very, very fast. But um, some people uh, do want things. I, I would sometimes say that it's, it's good to protect others, that if I'm in the middleman passing something from person A to person C, you know, I don't necessarily want to be passing something to see that's going to cause them problems. So uh, I might run a, a virus check on a thumb drive or something that I'm passing. Uh, Cal, uh, you're about the only one left because Dave had to leave more. So um, Cal, yeah, anything you do on protection like that before you leave? No. Um, I, I really don't. Uh, the uh, the biggest concern lately has been all the containers with snaps uh, about getting software that you don't know what's in it. Um, but generally, the classic distribution method is so distributed that anything that creeps in, uh, it's generally found and rooted out uh, quickly. So. Uh, I guess I, I think my protection is isolation. So I'll isolate things or isolate machines or keep things offline, uh, you know, keep backups offline. 
that that kind of protection. But I don't use any active program. Uh, and in, fi in fact, I always thought the virus detectors had to be, you know, into the root of windows that had opened more attack surface than they closed. And then you had to trust who was giving you the virus programs. Yeah. So it's kind of a philosophy answer rather than a program answer. And Cal, uh, would you do me a big favor and send me all of the Linux articles you have written this year? And when you create one for your newsletter, just kind of send it off to me so I can include them in the push uh, stuff that I send out to all the other editors. And thank you so much for doing that. Okay, thank you. And with that, I have to leave, uh, John. Thanks a lot for your help today. Thanks. Andy. They're all gone. They're all gone. I know. You and me. Judy and Bill. Yeah. Okay, Andy. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I was. Oh, come uh, on. You were on the protection. I didn't. I was. I was back on the remote access. Oh, okay. We're going to come back to that. Okay. So hang, hang okay. there. I just wanted you to make sure before Cal left, I wanted him to be able to comment on on the protection part too. The only the only thing that I do on the protection side is I have a, an icon in the taskbar for updates. And whenever I get on, there's a check mark, everything's good. If not, I just wanna make sure that it's up to date because from the people that I've spoken to, the, the biggest single vulnerability after you know being stupid, opening up email attachments, you don't know where they came from. Besides the stupidity, as far as the system weakness, it's not keeping it updated. So I just wanna make sure that all the updates are in place. Exactly, and that's that's a key figure or key concept is that when something happens to Linux, it's usually because somebody who is responsible for updating things on a server didn't, and therefore that caused the problem. So you keep your computers updated and be smart about it. You can. Uh, in the Linux world, if you wanted to have something, there's a program called Clam AV, which is uh, uh, terminal uh, pro, you know, uh, command line, or the graphical one is, a, is called Clam TK. And so you can use that to scan things that you have coming in and see if, if, it's, if it's not, uh, or if it's right. Uh, Sophos does have a free uh, version for Linux for a single user. And there was one other one that I looked up and, oh, that was that Enos, uh, e, e something, ECOT, whatever, 24. But it says that they stopped supporting it in the third quarter of this year and they stopped uh, letting you download it last year. So forget about that. But uh, Sophos does have a free single user scan, but I'm agreeing with Andy and with with uh, uh, Cal. Smarts is the way to do it. Keep your computer updated and uh, do that. Do it that way. Pittsburgh, John. Uh, yeah, what, I have one comment and I have one question. So uh, I've been I've been seeing a lot more in uh, online and in print where you know the Linux servers are starting to be targeted with malware and viruses and whatnot. And um, so you know, just like anything else, as the as the Linux user base grows, then the hackers and the bad guys start to focus their attention on mm -hmm. that particular group. So, uh, and leading into my next question, or my question, is there any kind of a sandboxing program for Linux distros that anybody knows of? I think there is a, a distro maybe that does it. And, you know, some of the browsers do the sandboxing but I, I don't have at the top of my head. Uh, but not a, not a uh, like a standalone program that, that actually you could install that 
you can use with the distro. Okay, I, I just yeah. was throwing that out. I wasn't sure because I know there are for the Windows side. I'm not they sure about Mac, but um, just wondering if anybody knew whether or not there well, was one. Of them, so. We have almost hey. 60 people here. Maybe somebody else does know. Hey, John. Yeah. If as far as a sandbox, I use VirtualBox. Oh just yeah, so yeah. If you have a question, you know, if you're not sure about something. Just set up a VM and play with it in there. Uh, you that's like true. It away. Yeah, I, I never, I never even thought of that. Sorry. Yeah, we we've talked about in past uh, workshops about virtual machines. And we said that our feeling is that everybody should have, Windows included, everybody should have a virtual machine identical to what you're running so that you can always try something first in the virtual machine and see if it causes problems and updates or whatever, or programs, and uh, then try it on your real one. So we're I, I'm a, an advocate for everybody having a virtual machine of their own uh, kind. So you try out something first. Try out that update that's coming through. If it crashes your virtual machine, what, no big deal. But if it crashes your computer, it could be a big deal for you. And if Dave Melton were here, he would say ditto. Yeah. Okay. He, uh, he did a presentation about that when two presentations ago, two months ago or something. He was yeah. having problems with VirtualBox and was trying something new, but it was a little bit more convoluted. Andy. No, I'm done. I, I just had to comment on VirtualBox. Yeah, he can't he can't lower. He's on a phone. So oh, yeah. Oh. Okay. Uh, anybody else? Okay, now we'll go back to remote access. Uh, how many of you people provide tech support for friends and family? that are not sitting next to you. What do you do for um, remote access tech support? Bill, you, you were saying you're doing that or? I was just raising my hand, but I use yeah. one that's strictly for Windows and that's yeah. um, Quick Assist, which I, I like, but it's only available for our Windows 10 and 11, but it works perfectly. Yeah. Good, okay, Andy? Uh, again, cross-platform, uh, remote access. I like uh, any desk. <laughs> so does John. I, I, yeah. I, was, I was using TeamViewer, but uh, I got the nasty gram twice about, you know, you're using it too much. And, it, you know, I'm retired, I play. And uh, so I didn't like that. But at home for looking at different machines, um, for the remote desktop on the Windows side or to remote into Windows machines, they have the uh, remote desktop client under Windows. On the Windows platform, it's multi-desk, but on the Linux side, it's called Remina. And it's mm. a great uh, remote desktop to go to Windows machines. Spell that since you can't put it in the chat box. R-E-M-M-I-N-A. It's available, you just, you know, here's the machine name or the IP or whatever, and it gives you multiple tabs. It's, uh, you're on a, a Linux desktop and you're trying to look at a Windows machine, desktop, laptop, or whatever. It's great. John. Andy stole my thunder. Oh, <laughs> uh, what, I do, what I do like about the AnyDesk is Windows, Mac, Android, iOS, Linux, FreeBSD, Raspberry Pi, Chrome OS. Can't beat that. And it's free. Oh, yeah. And, and you know, I, I'm in the midst of Sunday doing a remote access presentation. And then I do another one tonight. Um, and I tell people that I used to be a team viewer, just like Andy was. But the big reason I left team viewer, which I still use once in a while, because if I have somebody that hasn't doesn't have any desk, then we have to do a team viewer first, then get any desk. 
But for me, it was the fact that Team Viewer over the years has reduced the number of features that Linux users can use versus what Windows users have. With any desk, you, you know, there's no difference. You all have the same tools. So, um, you know, I, I'm just a fan of the any desk too. Hey, John. Easy. Yeah. So, the, and the problem with Team Viewer, because I used it too, is if you didn't have the same version on each end, oh. it wouldn't let you connect. <laughs> and then, yeah. I had to, then I had to use any desk to go into the remote computer to update the Team Viewer. So we, it was like crazy. So right. Oh, yeah. Much simpler, so. Yeah. Kevin. Yes, <clears throat> I'm going to chime in here. Um, I, I also was a team viewer user, except I, I paid for it. And um, Ooh, wow, you've got a lot more money than I do. Well, it's not that I have a lot more money. It's that COVID came in and my wife, after three times of saying, Kevin, you can't go in and see people anymore. Right. I finally listened and said, OK, I have to turn my business upside down and do what I tell people I would never do, which is do remote stuff. So I had to go get one. Um, after a little bit of research, it's the only one I could find that really seemed to do the job, but it had some real misgivings compared to any desk. Many, uh, Team Viewer would only let me connect to one device for the over, for the thousand dollars I paid them. And when I said, "Gee, you know, I want to talk to iPads and iMacs or whatever it was," uh, they said, "Well, sure, just give us another three hundred bucks." So that brought the seven hundred dollars to a thousand. And I said, "Well, so now I can talk to an iPad and I can talk to a Windows machine, right? Or I can talk to two devices." Or, oh no, no, you still can only talk to one device at a time. And I just said, "Okay." And at the end of that, I found AnyDesk, and Good. AnyDesk allowed me to connect to multiple devices at one time with one client, which was awesome, because occasionally I would need that. And um, uh, the cost was like less than a third of the cost of AnyDesk. I mean, less than a third of the cost of TeamViewer. Um, but I did have one concern, and I'd be interested to know if anybody else out there ran into this. When I connected to, um, and now the memory's a little fuzzy, I think it was, it was, um, I th it was either a um, Android box or a, um, or a uh, uh, iPad, I think. Um, I had them close. I had, or it could have been an i an i uh, Mac also. Uh, I had them close the session, and after they closed any desk, I was still able to see their machine totally, and I still oh. had access to it. And that scared the heck out of me because I like to be really, really on the up and up with my clients, and I don't want to have them close the software, assuming I'm out of there and me not be there. I, I really, I don't want that. That's, there may be people out there that do, but not me. So when they close the program, I want that software to be done. And under certain circumstances, it's not doing that. And that um, really concerned me. So I was wondering if any of you folks had had similar, uh, similar issues. Um, I guess this isn't a tech support call, call so I'm sorry. But anyway, yeah. I use AnyDesk. I've been quite happy with it. I've actually had to control computers from my cell phone. Uh, I've been able to access iPads, iPads and iPhones. I can only see the screen. I can't control it. Um, but it works in almost every other case. It was only one of the case that it gave me a problem. So it's an awesome tool. John, have you ever had that problem? I've only connected between Windows and Linux. I haven't tried gone out on the uh, the iPad and Android yet. Okay. Uh, uh, there is uh, uh, been articles on uh, Zoom on Macs that uh, it was leaving the microphone open after the session ended. Mm -hmm. Supposedly there is a, a bug fix out there when the uh, individual does apply it. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, but th this was any desk and um, it was very bizarre. Okay, carry on, John. It goes over to Bud. Oh, that's right. Sorry, bud. No problem. Uh, I've been a team viewer user for a long time. I haven't used it for the last couple of years or so, but I'm just learning about any desk. Um, would that be a possible uh, subject for uh, session here? 
Oh, absolutely. I even have somebody who knows how to give a presentation on it. Oh, that'd be fantastic. I'd really look forward to seeing that. I'm going to start investigating it now. Any desk. When would you like to sign up for that, John? <laughs> <laughs> That's the priest. Or, Bud, uh, we can send you the uh, uh, meeting link where, where he's giving it this week. Well, that that will work too. <laughs> That's it's tonight. So I'm okay. going to be I'm going to be in New York tonight, six thirty. <laughs> okay, so it's so, so, uh, three thirty our time. So. Yeah. Uh, so middle is, is that Rochester? No, uh, PC uh, tech users. Oh, that's yeah. right. Oh, oh, but I'd love to have you go to that. They're a new group, and it would be fun to have another body from. I've been there. I, in fact, I gave them their first presentation. Send, send me the another, link. Another body from California. Send me I'll the send, link. I'll send it to Judy, and Judy can send it to you. I've already okay. got it sixteen thousand times, John. Thank you. Oh, I only got it once. <laughs> oh, oh no. <laughs> that's all I need. You know, once. Okay. You know, Saturday, Saturdays, yeah. just a funny Saturday or uh, no Sundays, Sunday's presentation. They sent me the link, but it was the uh, private link. And when I went to get on it and said, they're in another room, I'm going, uh Oh, luckily I had the regular link through my APCUG emails. Okay. Bill James. I was just going to say, uh, there's two uh, products you might want to use for iPads, iPhones, uh, this is one way it allows you to share the screen um, and, and you can show them, you know, what they need to do. And one is Zoom. You can um, share your screen with an iPad or iPhone. And the other program that I've used is one called Visor, uh, V-Y-S-O-R. And uh, it's a free version and also a paid version. And it, is, um, it allows you to share the screen as well. Thank you. And okay. Um, what I think I'll do right now is just open it up for anybody who wants to talk about, you know, other software uh, I had on that list, you know, for, uh, you know, cleaning up your, your computer. Because I'm thinking, you know, Windows, we had the C cleaner. Uh, whether anybody's using something different for email. But that's pretty much just, just cross-platform, uh, all the emails. Um, and the same thing for, you know, password managers. It's kind of cross. So I think right now we can kind of open things up that if anybody wants to talk about anything else in Linux software and share things, ask questions, other people can share, go ahead. Okay, I have something. Uh, what I have of John Mazur is a couple of... A couple of us have gone to the Tenacity website and they don't have anything there to download. And I'm not techy enough to understand what they're talking about. Ooh. John, are you sending us on a false mission? Okay, so I have to apologize for not doing my homework. Um, I, when I said I was using Tenacity, I am. I was using the Windows client, but when I, when I went to install the Windows one, I saw that they it showed that it was available for Linux, but apparently it they don't have the client available yet. So they're supposedly working on it, but it's not, that's why you're seeing that um, message, Judy, that there's nothing there because they haven't developed the Linux side yet. So keep ch checking back to see, eventually I'm sure they will, they will, um, get it um, you know, developed and then it'll be available. But I do apologize to everybody for that. It is available for Windows and Mac, I believe, so. Thank you so much. And yeah, great. I've gotten several other requests for your, your presentation tonight. So if you would like to uh, get the URL, the Zoom link for John's AnyDesk presentation tonight at 3.30 California time, you figure out your own. Um, put it in the chat box and I'll send it off to you. Yeah, the meeting starts at 6.30 and they have a short meeting of their cells first and then uh, they and send it's very short. And you will be linking up with the library in New York because um, they um, sponsor them, so to speak, They and they're using the library's Zoom account. Over to you, bud. Uh, 
topic you were looking for new topics or things different types of software uh i was kind of disappointed when i saw the list of uh, software tasks i'd like uh information on financial software quickbooks quicken uh tax preparation type software that's available for linux that's good okay we'll open that up because i don't do my finances that way i just do the old paper and pencil um Anybody have any experience comments other than we know that QuickBooks, you know, Quicken does not provide it, but you can do it with Wine maybe and run it that way. For people who might not know what Wine is, could you give a... Wine, Wine is the program that you install on Linux that will let you run the majority of Windows programs kind of inside that container area. And um, you have to, with the software, it either has to be free Windows type software or you have to have the license for it. You just can't you know, run uh, an unpaid for version in wine. You, know, you have problems because it asks for uh, licenses. But I don't use it because I'm not running um, uh, Windows programs on my Linux computer. Anybody okay. else though? You know, there's GNU Cash is, is uh, you know, a, a finance program that I know that I've heard people use, but I have heard that, you know, unless you um, uh, run Quicken or QuickBooks through Wine, they choose not to make a version for Linux. Hmm. But if everybody got in touch with the company and asked them why they don't, they might. Mm -hmm. But I don't think there's any out there because uh, we've discussed this several times. And people who are looking for, for a quick inversion are not happy campers that they can't find one. Andy. I don't use any of the financial management because I'm not an accountant by trade. And just, you know, paying my bills keeps me enough involved financially. But what I did sign up for years ago, uh, I think it's part of TurboTax, is a Mint account. Mint will link to your bank account, your brokerage accounts, to, you know, your 401k, IRA, whatever. And you can download all the transactions. I'm going back uh, I don't know, seven, eight years, literally thousands of transactions. Everything that's gone against my credit card comes out of my checking account, whatever, just download it as a CSV. And LibreOffice Calc does a real nice job of parsing the data, and you can do reports and search and pivot tables and all kinds of stuff. I don't know what, what else people are looking to do in their uh in their financial management but uh it's a it's a nice option for me just get all the transactions separate the debits and credits and away you go thank you are you just going to open it up for a little bit for um email to see what everybody's using with email yeah i was going to mention too just as we you know jumping around that in terms of cleaner that people think of and uh, like uh, C cleaner and whatever, uh, there's a great program that I have on mine called Stacer. It's a multi-tool, lets you know how your computer is running, does have a place for software removal, does have a place for cleanup. Uh, so that's a good program. Also, it doubles as a system monitor. Uh, but the program that, that I've been talking about that's the C cleaner type program is called Bleach Bit. And the warning is that Bleach Bit can clean very, very thorough. So you need to make sure that you know what you're cleaning. But what I like about Bleach Bit is that it has a huge long list of what do you want to clean. And when you pick on something, it kind of gives you a warning, says, well, this is going to clean all of this or remove all of this. Uh, but it's kind of like a, a C cleaner on steroids 
uh, with the amount of stuff that it can, you know, clean. So there are programs that, you know, match out against things like C Cleaner and, and uh, uh, each of your computers will have usually a system monitor program that will look a lot like the Windows Task Manager with the same exact tabs of processes and, you know, programs uh, just like that. So, you know, Linux has that too, so you can keep track of what's going on, but there's always a few other ones. So yeah, what about uh, email? What do people in Linux use for email? I use Proton Mail. I also have Gmail that I have for a long time. Mike Fungerman uses Proton Mail. Speak up, everybody. Yeah. Or, or we're just going to say everybody uses Yahoo. <laughs> Thunderbird. <laughs> okay, use the client version. Yep, I have Thunderbird down. That's been my long time client program. Uh, I've decided not to link my Proton Mail to Thunderbird. There is a bridge for that. Um, I need to go back and try it because it's, uh, it's been revised. But I'm, I'm guessing most people are either Microsoft Mail or uh, Gmail for what it, they do. Instead of Yahoo, we'll say everybody that didn't speak up uses Gmail. Um, Could I just ask um, John to tell us again that you said spacer or stacer as that initial cleaner? S-T-A-C-E-R, stacer. Okay, thank you. And it's, it's a combination of the system monitor and lots of different tabs for, or side tabs for uh, cleaning up, uh, cache cleaning, program removal, uh, you know, all, all around. But bleach bit is the big deep cleaner. Like okay. C cleaner. And, then, and then secondly, on your presentation for night in New York, is the topic AnyDesk? Yes. Yep. Okay. It's AnyDesk and TeamViewer, and I and I kind of tell why I don't like it. But I, I'm going to do the, the AnyDesk, and I'll do a live demo of AnyDesk. And you can also have this presentation for your personal group by creating a speakers bureau request. So if you like it, invite him in. He doesn't have anything else to do. <laughs> no, that's not the truth. But if anybody else, I, I use AnyDesk a, a fair amount and um, I do like it, but I'm always open for tips and tricks that other people uh, find and use. So, yep. Okay. I was talking yeah. about John Kennedy. Yeah. Uh, I have a question here from a Mac person. And a Mac user would like to compare Linux versus Monterey. Is there anybody here that could speak to that? I know Dave can't. I don't think Cal could. So, and Orv couldn't. So, the fact that they're not here doesn't. All I can I, make a comment. I anyway, but what's? I don't understand the question really. Okay, John. Yeah. What I was going to say is that that uh, the Mac has a history that goes back to this to the roots of Linux. They all came from Unix, and so. Mac is very closely related to Linux, more so than it would be to Windows. But I don't know if Monterey must be the newest version, maybe. It's the newest uh, version. So, okay, Tim. Tim's agree on that. So uh, all I do know from people who use it is that if you know Linux, there's a lot of things you can do in uh, Mac. And if you know Mac, there's a lot of things you can do in Linux. Thank you. Um what Linux commands uh, may be used in Apple Terminal? Probably a lot of them. Oh, Alex? Tom has his hand up. Tom, you're on. Need to unmute, Thomas. Thomas, unmute. Thank you so much. Okay. I, I access my Raspberry Pis uh, from a terminal in on the Mac without any problem at all. Good. It just SSH into them. So um, if, if you've had some experience with terminal on your Mac, you shouldn't have any problems dealing with uh, uh, Linux. Yeah. 
there, you, there, I'll say there could be some slight changes because even with Linux, uh, between the Arch Linux family, the Debian family, and the Red Hat family, there are a few different commands that they have created for their own way. But there are a lot of commands that go across everybody. Uh, so I would imagine that that over the years that Mac has made theirs just a little bit special towards themselves. We is need there, Craig right here for that answer. Okay. Is there uh, anybody here that uses Mac hardware and Linux? Oh, no. Thomas has got his hand waving. Okay. I saw that. I figured he might be able to answer that. Unmute. Thank you. Okay. Yes, I have. Um, in fact, my last project was to take an old Mac Mini and turn it into an Ubuntu computer. So, and it's sitting on the desk over there. Um, so I've used both. I am not a totally conversant person in Linux. That's why I'm here listening. Good. Glad to have you here. You might want to check some of the, our back Linux uh, workshops. There's a playlist with them at our YouTube channel. Yeah, it's my understanding that now it's a lot easier to put Linux on a Mac once they switch to the Intel processor. When they had their other one, it oh. didn't work because Linux is okay. for Intel and AMD. Is but John, they've gone back to, an, to a proprietary uh, processor called the M1. Now they're not using the Intel processors anymore. Oh. If you I have an old the, Mac with an Intel processor, it will work. Yep. Yeah. yep. But the newer ones will not. They're all okay. M1s and soon to be M2s. That's unfortunate. Well, they don't want something running on their computer. I know. That's why we had Secure Boot come in for a while. I have, let me see, I've got two new messages. Oh, uh, a question about creating a group's newsletter, whether to use um, word processing or a, you know, definite uh, publisher type program. If you create your newsletter in um, Writer and you save it as a PDF, you cannot tell them apart. And Groups tell me, oh, we lost our editor. We don't know what to do. And the editor needs to learn publisher. Well, nobody wants to do anything like that now. Just the fact that they have a volunteer is good enough. So if that person is a Windows group, they can create that newsletter. And like I said, Word or Writer, your pleasure. Nobody can tell the difference. If you're and looking for... Everybody knows a word processing program and hardly nobody these days uses or Publish. wants to learn something convoluted. Pittsburgh, John. Yeah, I, I um, want to address that issue with uh, about Linux on the new um, Apple silicones. I read an article where somebody's working on trying to get it to work on the um, the new chips that Apple is using in their machines right now. So hopefully down the road that will uh, that will, won't be a problem. But and the person that was asking about uh, Mac and Linux were they trying to were they trying to see if there were Linux distros that looked like like the Mac? Let, or? let me check and see if he is still here. Because there are some there are some distros that have a Mac look to them. He's not here. Okay. Because he asked this at 9 19 a.m. And yeah. I do not recognize his name, so I think this is first workshop. Okay. And then uh, one more thing. Could I can I have permission to share for a second? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> so I get, say, John. Don't, don't don't get too quick on that. I know it. And John, uh, Pittsburgh, John, would you ask me the question about the Mac guy in the chat box? And then I'll send him an email and ask him what? Blah, blah. Yeah. 
Yeah, I'll, I'll do that. And are you going to send the link to the any desk? Because I sent you a text. I, I'm not. Yes, to everybody. Honest. Yes. I'll okay. send you one of my many emails I received from them. Boy, okay. you're putting me on the spot. Okay, John, go ahead. Share. Okay. Um, yeah, so this, I came across this recently. I don't, I'll, maybe some of you know about it. It's called, it's a, um, it's a private YouTube client called FreeTube. And um, what's nice about it is, and let me just, well, first of all, I did check, Judy. It is available for Linux. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you I'll, let me scroll down here and show you. So here's the here's my proof right here. Runs on Windows, Mac, and Linux, and several Linux distributions. But what's nice about it is you don't even need an account. Like in regular YouTube, you have to have a Google account. You don't even need an account for this. Um, it doesn't track you. It's it's private. You can import your subscriptions from YouTube into the uh, free tube. Um, and then uh, all the data is local. All subscription and history are stored locally. It has the same familiar YouTube interface. It's cross-platform. Here's the big one here. No ads. Ad-free experience as you watch. And it's open source, so they continue to, to, to develop it. Uh, which is nice and then it's you know multilingual you know several languages and apparently there are other features uh, that are um coming down the pipeline but uh yeah i mean it's i i, I started using it and um you know here's the windows 64-bit mac uh, ubuntu and debian fedora red hat uh, the flat pack and uh app image and then you have some arch uh arch distributions that uh it's available for as well. So, um, and I think if I'm not mistaken on the PC Linux, the one I'm using now, the PC Linux KDE, uh, it actually came pre-installed. Hmm. So that's, that's how I found out about it. So. so when it says, scroll back down to where it says the orange stuff, keep going. Stop the blue, Oops. the blue stuff. Sorry. Yeah. Okay, when right it there. says, look, all subscriptions and history are stored locally. Where is locally? Well, to your to your machine, your local, you know, your, your hard drive, yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. gosh. Yeah, I know. I was thinking about just using it as an additional place to put APCUG stuff. Well, I, you know. My, I, I, my I, role in life is to get it off my, get all that stuff off my hard drive. Yeah. So, but, you know. Um, cool. The, the fact that there are no ads, you know, that's to me that's a that's the one thing there that is the is the um, thing that I like the most. The fact that you don't have to, you know, you're not in the middle of your video, you're not stopping for an ad. So, right. Well, anyway. that would be good for groups. Well, yes. let me, well, let me ask this though: Is this a viewer, or can you upload to this? Oh. Uh, uh, that I don't know, John. Oh, because it sorry. seems to me trying to read all this, it's for viewing, and I don't see anything about you know uploading because you'd have uh, to have an account or something yeah, to fact upload that you to. Don't have to have an account. Yeah. yeah. Now I don't know whether like I don't know whether you can create. And it doesn't look like there's any place to create an account. Yeah, because it I says can. it's a YouTube client. So yeah. So for viewing purposes, you know, if you don't want to deal with ads. You know, Tra and tracking, yeah, things like that. Tracking, right? So, you know, just throwing that out there. Uh, you know, we're all concerned about privacy and all that stuff. So, good one. Thanks. I think that's all I had. Yeah, thank you. It's been around since 2018. The free tube. Yeah. Yeah, I just discovered it. So. Yeah, <laughs> I don't see anything about uploading anything. So my theory was. Um, wrong I'll put, uh, yeah. what, what, the, data, what database software is out there for linux uh LibreOffice has its own database and, and it's called base oh okay well they, and you know linux has its own my uh, you know uh, my sql or all that stuff so it, it has all the major databases if you're a database person but what's nice is that LibreOffice comes with a 
database component automatically as opposed to when you used to have to pay the extra money to get access with Office. Cool. Are there any more questions from anybody about anything? I will remind people that we're looking for ideas. Uh, I'm, my, 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 my brain is kind of empty now as to what. Next month, we're going to be doing a, a Linux for Beginners. It's my Everyday Linux or Everyday Activities Part 2. Uh, it will not be enjoyable for experienced people because it's going to be a very down-to-earth. Watch me as I show you that I do things in Linux just like you do in Windows. But a lot of people want to know, oh, well, how do you do that? How do you do this? And so that. Then uh, we we're trying to come up with something for uh, May. And Orv and Cal are trying to think of things. But need to know, what do you want? What, does, what do you want? Beginners, what do you want? What else do you want to know? And experienced users, not expert, just experienced users. Rem remember, it's warts and all. And yeah. when, is there any interest out there for many hands-on demos of some of the uh, programs that people have talked about today? Yeah, put that in if the chat there box is, for Judy. Huh, what? Put that in the chat box for Judy. Yes, please put it in the chat box for me because I've already made notes on my question page. Uh, Howard, you're on. Yes, um, I had questioned uh, quite a few sessions back about uh, printers and John recommended uh, a program called TurboPrint. It is a, a paid program, but... Um, Oh, you're muted, Howard. There All right, you can you hear me now? Yeah. All right. Left off with, it's a paid program. Right, it's a paid program, but uh, I used a 30-day trial, free trial, and it uh, works very well, probably better than the uh, Canon interface that, yeah, that yeah. comes with the printer. Um, but uh, since I do most of my printing from Windows computers. I haven't uh, got up the interest in paying for it, but it, it made it very easy to uh, use it for Linux. I've had some success getting my Linux um, programs connected to the printer and, and making test pages, but when I go to print a document, it just never seems to work out. So. Uh, that was, I just want to let you know, I was very successful with the turbo print and I thank you for your advice. Oh, great. Glad thank to hear you. that. Uh, thank you. That's great. Andy. Um, when they were talking about uh, some of the system monitoring or, you know, the remote access, helping people out. A lot of times I I'm still at the, I don't know, I don't know how to get the information that I want. What kind of system is it? You know, what's the hard drive like? Things like that. Two command line uh, tools that I use to find out what's on a system. One is called Glances, and the second one is Inxi, I-N-X-I. And they're both, you know, type in a couple of letters, and you get more information than you ever want to know about what's on a particular computer. Exactly. Uh, a lot of times the uh, information is kind of in a program that you have on your start menu, but it doesn't make sense that that's the one you have. M my Mint has has that where there's something. It's not the system monitor, but there's another one, and it has a lot of that. But as Orv would say, uh, using the command line uh, and run a few simple commands, you'll get more than you want to know about your computer uh, on there. Well, I so did that, a happy dance, you know, doing uh, the, the DF command or the free command or whatever. And mm -hmm. oh, wow, wow, oh, wow. This, but these two, these other two commands give me a boatload of information right there. Yeah. And it's something to, uh, you know, it's a, it's a good starting point. We'll have to throw that back to Orv and say, People are wanting more information about uh, easy command 
line commands that will produce lots of information. I think Inksy and uh, Inksy, I think, is installed on most of the newer distributions now. Anyway, you don't even. It's not even a download. Just go to a terminal. I N X I uh, dash capital F for me, and away you go. And glances just. Typing glances at a command line. You get a whole bunch of stuff there. Philadelphia, Philadelphia. Pennsylvania, John, you are the last to speak before Mr. Kennedy takes us away. Um, yeah, question about printing. So when I when I installed the, the PC Linux OS, you know, about a couple months ago, um, it installed my printers, no problem. I have two Epson printers that are hooked up to the network. And uh, it, the printing was working fine. And then one day I went to print something and it wouldn't print either printer. And the document was in the queue waiting to be printed. Couldn't get it to print. So I rebooted the, I rebooted the printers. I rebooted the computer. I even rebooted the router and it still won't print. So I'm wondering if anybody has any suggestions as to what I might do. Like, do I need to like uh, delete the printers and then re have them reinstall themselves again or? Gee, I'm having the same problem with my HP color printer here. <laughs> Identical. <laughs> I, my, you know, I'm not, networking is my worst area. But what I've learned is that what might solve a lot of problems is static IP address or permanent ones. Because if, if your network hiccups, then, you know, the printer is giving off one IP address and your computer is looking for a different IP address. So... Um, you know, making them, you know, fixed so they don't keep changing. Because uh, I don't understand, I, I don't, I wouldn't understand why if it was working for a while, unless there was an update that caused it. Uh, John? Yeah, Tim. And uh, uh, on printers, and I didn't think of it until uh, uh, you brought it up uh, just now. Uh, all my printers, I always set up a static address. It def they all default to DHCP. You are running a lease on it. So if you go away long enough from your home and you're not using it, it will lose uh, 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 the address it had. And when it, uh, you come back, it may or may not have the same address. And that uh, could be the source of the problem. With statics, uh, uh, NASA's would be another one that I would set up a, a static address on so that it's always available at a specific address. So is that is that done at the the OS level or is that done at through the router? It's at the printer itself. The printer itself, okay. Yeah, so you have to go into the setup and go into networking It'll probably uh, give you some indication that it's set up to uh, DHCP. It usually gives you an option uh, in the little uh, uh, control window uh, where you can set up a static address instead. But you've got to know the address range of your router outside of the DHCP. Thank you. Kurt's got another answer, probably. That's right. You're much better off setting static IP addresses in your router. Uh, the, the best way is to take and, and do it by the MAC address. Then the MAC, and, and it could be anywhere. Uh, and your router will take and, and ensure that whenever that device connects, it gets whatever it's whatever you've configured. And it's best if it's not in the dynamic range. I'm just going to try uninstalling mine and installing it again. Anything else? Really? I'd like to have breakfast. Thank you so much. <laughs> we'll, we'll do it. Edwin, Edwin didn't raise his hand physically or 
digitally, but I happen to be able to see him. So that's why we do it the other way. So Edwin, un unmute. Uh, yeah, uh, I, I had quite a bit of trouble with my um, HP printers and I was able to actually go in to the device managers, you know, system. Now this was years ago. Uh, I haven't had to deal with that in a while, but I was actually able to change the, uh, your address manually and that will get you back online with those HP printers. And I sure hope Edwin has a last name somewhere. Davidson. I'm in, uh, I'm in uh, Dayton Microcomputer Association, APCUG. Please, please rename yourself so it shows up for me. Oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> yeah, we, 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 save, we save the lists and that way we can match up you for sure. Yeah, I All right. have 16 Edwins. We're trying oh, okay, to break another, sorry. another 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 record. So, um, oh, thank everybody for coming uh, in. Look at that, Philadelphia John. We can't get. Uh, I feel it. Sorry, Pennsylvania nope, John. We can't get rid of him. No, nope, he's cool. clapping. He oh, was clapping. Okay, that was a clap. Wait, yeah, cool. that Thanks was a clap. Participating. Yeah. So, thank everybody for coming. Uh, we'll be back next Saturday for our uh, photo editing hands-on. That registration will be coming out. Uh, if you were here last month and got the beginnings of it, a lot of people said, okay, I want to, I don't want you to just tell me about it. I want to be able to do it. And so we're going to be sending the link. You can download the software. There's a 30 day free trial. So you can just download it and do the things with us Saturday. And if you like the software for photo editing, then you can purchase it. If you don't, you just delete it. Uh, and then we'll be back the week after that on Wednesday with our big, uh, annual backup. I want the Linux people to share that we do backups because anything can happen to your computer. It's not the, the, the viruses we worry about. We can accidentally delete things. So we'll thank everybody for being with us. Please send Judy some ideas if you have for Orv and for Cal as to put together some workshops. Also send to Judy. I got an idea for a Wednesday workshop and I can even help do it.